Welcome to Another Round, a podcast by the Pacific Research Institute. I'm your host, Rowena Ichon. In this episode, Tim and I are PRI's Director of Communications, and I chat with Steve Greenhut. Californians know Steve best from his witty and insightful columns from California papers such as the San Diego Union Tribune and the Orange County Register. We think tankers know him as the Western Region Director of the R Street Institute. Indeed, many think tanks have published Steve's work, including the Reason Foundation and PRI. When he's not a policy wonk or writing his column, Steve loves houses, spending his early career as a remodeling and building editor of Better Homes and Gardens. Steve lives today outside of Sacramento with his wife on a farm with 30 goats, six cats, four chickens, two dogs, and one alpaca, but no partridges or pear trees. Now, with a guy this interesting, you absolutely have to stay to the end to hear his wine recommendations. Welcome to another round, Steve. Steve, as we look back at the legislative session, one of the biggest issues was housing. The legislature passed a package of bills on the final days of the session to, quote, unquote, increase housing affordability. You've written a lot on these bills this year. Will they improve housing affordability and accessibility or just make the problem worse? Oh, yeah, absolutely not. It's there's a the legislative package is uh, mostly about raising taxes and uh, increasing the cost of building housing. It's it's the, the problem in California is that we're not building enough housing. There are all sorts of things ranging from the California Environmental Quality Act, which is the uh, uh, landmark environmental law that makes it really easy to sue to stop any project to all sorts of local impediments. It's uh, a lot of projects. There's one in the Santa Clarita Valley that's uh, still in approvals. It start they start started trying to get approvals in the 80s. And meanwhile, our population has skyrocketed and it's a simple supply and demand issue. So the legislature had a package that was stalled for a while, but it eventually got through. There are three major bills. Uh, SB2 actually increases the fees from $75 to $225 on many real estate transactions, not including sales, but refinancing any sorts, all sorts of, uh, of things like that. So we're just adding costs to doing real estate transactions. And then the money goes to to uh, a fund that'll uh, pay for government subsidized low income high density housing. SB3 would be a uh, would place before voters on the November ballot a $3 billion uh, bond, which is, you know, will of course comes out of the state general fund, will create pressure for new taxes that again is, is for government subsidies. So the, the state legislature seems to think that the way you solve the housing problem is by uh, creating more government programs. The, the only one that has a short Shred of, of goodness to it is SB 35. Essentially, it streamlines the approval process for uh, many high density affordable housing projects. But in return, the unions got prevailing wage, which is the union uh, generated wage rate. So that could increase uh, the cost of building those projects. So it's easier to approve them, but it'll be more costly to build them. So that's At the very least, one would say none of this is going to do anything about California's housing crisis. And there are other bills like one that promotes inclusionary zoning for rental properties, which means that developer has to include below market rates in addition to their market rate one. So the people who get the below market rates essentially win a lottery and then the prices go up for all the market rates. So that actually makes the problem worse by increasing the cost of rental housing. So that's how they that's how the legislature decided to deal with it. If they learn something about markets and uh, allowing developers to build, uh, I think that's where we're going to find the solution, but they're not ready for that yet. Uh, Steve, the cap and trade deal that passed in July continues to be hugely controversial. Uh, Assembly Republican leader Chad Mays was the target of a huge political firestorm over the bills, and he arguably lost his leadership post because of the deal that he cut. What are your thoughts on those bills and the political fallout? Yeah, well, it looks like uh, Chad Mays might have some uh, primary uh, contenders, so it'd be interesting to see what's next for Chad Mays. And uh, what was astounding was he got got nothing for his deal. So, you know, he could have uh, pushed for an alternative. There are all sorts of things he could have done, some uh, controls on uh, the California Air Resources Board. He could have pushed for, instead of cap and trade, let's say a uh, revenue neutral carbon tax. If the goal is to reduce carbon, then you can tax carbon, but you have to reduce taxes in other areas, so you're not increasing taxes 
on anyone. You're just instead, you know, trying to punish an externality. He did nothing like that. He just kind of sold out. And then he went around uh, on a, uh, you know, on a tour with the Democrats bragging about his bromance with Anthony Rendon, the uh, the assembly uh, speaker, who's a nice guy, but I don't know if I were the Republican leader, I'd go around bragging about my bromance. And it just, all the photo ops, it just seemed, it was unseemly. And the Republican grassroots are really mad. And there, uh, there's an effort to, to recall uh, Josh Newman, the Democratic senator from Fullerton, and that Fullerton area seat is a, still a heavily Republican seat. It's pretty close on, 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 uh, on registrations, but it should be a Republican seat. So Newman cast a deciding vote for the gas tax. Uh, was that back in April? And then in July, uh, the Republicans, eight Republicans voted for this cap and trade extension, which the LAO, the Legislative Analyst Office, said will cost uh, by 2021, under one scenario, an extra 63 cents a gallon gasoline. So uh, so there's an effort now, I don't know how serious it is, quite frankly, to directly repeal the, the, the gas tax. So, so but it's the, it's got what's left of the Republican grassroots squirming and upset. So we'll see. So there are a lot of political ramifications. And, um, you know, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, so that's why he lost his post, although another fairly moderate uh, guy uh, got the uh, got the, got the post. So we'll see what the political fallout is. And for cap and trade, I, I think I think that's it for now. It's been extended for 10 years. And I, I don't know. I don't think there's any big loom. There's always going to be efforts to expand and, and extend it for now. Um, you know, that's it. And we'll see what it's basically done is triggered an internal Republican uh, rebellion. It, it has provided Republicans the gas tax increase and cap and trade. It has provided them with a, a rallying cry. And, and there are Democrats who certainly uh, Democratic voters who certainly are upset at the increase in cost. So maybe maybe they can uh, make a few inroads. Uh, we'll see. Steve, another controversial bill was legislation rushed through the process at the last minute to gut the powers of the scandal-plagued Board of Equalization and create a new agency. In your view, was this legislation a good move, and what can taxpayers expect from the new agency? Yeah, it, it's kind of funny. The Board of Equalization, it sounds like something out of uh, Orwell's 1984, the Board of Equalization, uh, but it's really not about equalizing our status. It's just a, it's just a, 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 an elected tax board. It's, I believe, the only elected tax board in the country. And it's just to uh, make sure I think sales, sales taxes and, and uh, use taxes are uh, equalized and, uh, and business taxes. The thing about the Board of Equalization is it's been very taxpayer friendly. So I, when I, I wrote a column uh, lamenting the loss of the Board of Equalization, which is funny, it should be a libertarian's dream shutting down a tax <laughs> agency. But in reality, the three new tax agencies that are going to be created, they're accountable to the, uh, you know, to the, to the, the administrative bureaucracy uh, where we actually elect our Board of Equalization members. And a lot of times those Board of Equalization members, they ask some pretty tough questions of the bureaucrats. And I wrote a story, I know, for the Orange County Register about these uh, taco truck owners who uh, felt that they were uh, get, getting a raw deal. And the Board of Equalization member representing them stepped in. Uh, that has a lot of clout and there's a lot, it's a pressure point and it's a very useful thing. And now, now the Board of Equalization, it's in the Constitution, so it, it hasn't been disbanded, but it's been neutered. It, it exists, but it's it's not going to have the powers that it that it had, and it's um, it's not good for taxpayers. It's weird as it is to say you're better off with a, a tax board that has an elected official who's concerned about getting reelected uh, than to just have bureaucrats run the show. So this session was the first one under Proposition 54, which does something that journalists and political observers have been clamoring for for a long time to have more transparency by having all legislation sit in print for public review for at least 72 hours before the final vote is taken. And of course, the legislative leaders try to game the system and finagle around those requirements. So now that we've seen one session with Prop 54, what's your view? Do you think it has increased transparency? Do you think more needs to be done to increase legislative transparency? Well, it, it has shown the degree to which, um, you know, legislators can be craven and try to get a around the clear will of the people, that that proposition, it was a really important one because typically at the end of the session, we, we'd have these 
gotten amend bills where substantive policy would be inserted into the bill and then nobody had any time to see what was happening before it was voted on and before you know it is on the governor's desk and everyone's saying hey look what's in there so it's very important just a three you know 72 hours of course the legislature is still going to game the system any way they can now in fairness uh senate uh president pro tem uh kevin de Leon, uh don't believe he was any fan of it but he abided by the rules so he just he just followed the rules and uh on the assembly it was different they tried uh, arguing that it was uh i forget their exact argument but it was three days 72 hours after the house of origin i believe anyway they, they came up with an excuse for why it, it didn't apply but even it gets complicated but even they have softened on that and from what i see I'm trying to send back amended bills to the other house to make sure it gets 72 hours and we'll see it might end up in litigation depending on how uh, recalcitrant the assembly continues to be but it's good it's helpful there's no question about it i know there were a couple issues i was covering and uh we everyone was concerned about that 72 hour deadline so uh now is that going to reform sacramento of course not it would it would take uh, something a lot uh, more significant than that but that's an important and important good government reform and i like the fact that it gives us the members of the public the right to record our public officials doing the public's business in public we don't have the right to bust into their offices and record them doing everything but if if it's a public hearing we have a right to uh record it that's good it's good good measure one of the best things in a while although some reporters from my experience would love to bust into members well, office. as a reporter <laughs> yeah. myself former reporter myself absolutely i'd love to i wouldn't have and i don't know any that would have well maybe i can but think they, of a couple, a couple that would have liked to anyway. steve do you think this makes the uh, legislators behave better because they're being recorded i don't know most of the hearings are already recorded and uh when you watch them in action i mean i always uh, think that everyone ought to spend a little time on the california channel listening to the level of debate in the committee hearings and uh tim you've oh, worked up there it's not the high level no. of uh of uh policy debate in fact i wrote i wrote one story um about one bill that i think we might talk about later but that nobody could figure out what was the bill actually meant and one of the legislators that uh, was uh, senator richard ross said something to the effect of i'm confused and uh, another legislator said i'm still not sure they voted for it anyway but it's, <laughs> so it's not you know it's not the lincoln douglas debate or anything that goes on in there so uh, so i don't think so but i like the fact that we have an affirmative constitutional right uh, to record these people and i think uh, i think you're right every californian should spend at least a day or two watching what goes on in their government. I think they would be shocked by some of these hearings and the how, and Prop 54, I think, was definitely a step in the right direction, but how even when they do know what's in the bill, they don't really know what they're made, and debating. They'll vote for it. And they'll vote for it anyway. Well, remember those scared straight programs where at-risk youth would be taken to prisons or jails to be scared straight from a life of crime? Well, every voter should be scared straight at, at, about voting, right? They ought to see the legislature mm -hmm. in action and maybe they'll pay a little more attention to whom they vote. For. And the last night of session, because oh. that's where all the games happen. It's not where the magic happens. It's where yeah. all the damage really is done. Oh, yeah, ab absolutely. So so it, help, it helps, but, you know, there's we're way past the point where any one fix is going to really solve things. It just helps a little bit, yeah. So, Steve, you know, there are always winners and losers in the legislative session, and you could argue that this session was characterized by major battles among the various Democrat constituents constituency groups such as the environmental groups and the unions. For the most part, it seems like the unions emerged as the big winner this year. Um, is that your view or do you think some other group win the prize? No, that, that's definitely true. I think the unions uh, the unions were the winners, which isn't unsurprising. I mean, they strut around like they own the place because they basically do. And here's a headline in the Sacramento Bee, union power on display in California's just completed legislative session. And that's for, that's for sure. I mean, and the, and the public sector unions in particular, and there was a passage of quite a few, uh, you know, there's a 12 weeks of, of unpaid family leave, but it's extended to companies with as few as 20 employ, employers, and that's still costly, even though it's unpaid leave. And uh, and then there's the uh, extending of communities, college districts, and, um, and school districts paid leave, uh, paid maternity leave, pregnancy leave. Um, so there are all sorts of bills. There's one that uh, called, they, they call it the ban the box bill, where uh, um, you're not allowed to have the checkoff box if you had a, con a conviction. So uh, you don't have to, an employer no longer has the right to ask a person whether they have a conviction until they make a conditional job offer, which point I say, oh yeah, there was that mass murder.
murder back in uh, 97. And, and uh, you know, it's just going to be a heyday for lawyers, right? Because they're trying to rescind it. It's one thing to decide not to hire someone because of the conviction. I mean, these are all some of the un union things. They're prohibiting employers from asking about job applicant salary, uh, history, uh, all, there all sorts of things. And then there's the stuff that the unions won't allow to happen, which is a lot bigger. They won't allow any sort of reform of the pension system or the retiree medical system or reforming the California rule, which which is what makes it impossible to reduce benefits going forward, which uh, then uh, will put some cities on the on the, uh, the the way to bankruptcy. There were two bills that would give essentially give the names and private information of, of private workers to unions so that they could uh, contact them for uh, uh, union organizing. So it's just the, the unions got they got a lot. No question. The one one bill they didn't get, AB 1250, would have basically banned outsourcing at the counties. And the counties have a lot of clout and that would have just obliterated their budget. So but it's, you know, a two year session. So it'll, it'll come back again. So we got to keep. I, I always say nothing's ever dead until the legislature adjourns sine die and be uh, in the even year. And that really is true. One thing I thought was interesting, Carrie Jackson had a column that just came out kind of talking about these issues. And he compares even the major priorities of the year, like, you know, Democrats say housing is their priority. But yet, as you mentioned earlier, what does SB 35 have? Prevailing wage. Yep. Uh, you have the uh, electric car rebates, a huge issue for that. They have $140 million and cap and trade money for that. And what is in there? Got to be union friendly because Tesla is not the most right. union they, friendly company. Yeah, they inserted themselves in the in the uh, uh, union dispute with with Tesla at, uh, at Fremont. So on one hand, you're subsidizing Tesla, and on another hand, you're you're punishing them. Uh, so so essentially, they can't get the rebates unless they're cert certified right. as union friendly. So uh, it's really basically an invitation to take their plan over to to the Reno area where their Giga Factory One is, right. where they make the the batteries. And then allegedly the power grid bill, Jerry Brown wanted to regionalize California's power grid, and that allegedly died because it would have threatened the job. There was no job security for union electrical workers in California. Oh, right. And one of the bills, um, yeah, the modernizing the ports, that maybe that's the same bill. They, they forbid the use of the money to uh, automate things because they're afraid. It's just uh, the Luddites are in control up there, right? right? So, so on one hand, I mean, I did a column uh, a couple weeks ago about about how the California Democrats are kind of at war with themselves. On one hand, they tout the new tech economy as the uh, oh well, this is this is proof that California is on the cutting edge and we're uh, we're really moving ahead and our economy is good. But on the other hand, they do they they punish the tech industry because it's of the creative destruction that it, that it sows uh, with all these new uh, innovative technologies that that are a threat to a lot of the old unionized labor pools. So uh, usually they end up siding with the unions. I mean, the bottom line is you'd have to be insane to start a business in California, right? If you, if it were a labor intensive business and nobody in their right mind would start a manufacturing business in this no. state, I don't think. So the other thing that I think you could characterize 2017 as is the year of political grandstanding in the legislature. You know, we saw Democrats famously hire Eric Holder to sue Donald Trump. We saw countless anti-Trump administration resolutions kind of looking to score or political points. What are your thoughts on the legacy of these efforts? You know, you're a longtime legislative observer. Do you think this kind of political grandstanding is a good thing for the future of the legislative process in our democracy? It's pretty silly, and I'm not a Trump fan by any means. I think the legislators largely embarrass themselves, and I don't think the Trump administration cares about what California's lefty legislators think. In fact, I think it emboldens him and his most diehard supporters. I mean, I think it's a vote of confidence in their guy that the California's wacky legislators are spending so much time. But with the state actually has a lot of problems that legislators should be dealing with. And when they spend time at press conferences posturing, uh, you know, the three big bills may be related to Trump. Uh, you know, there's a good Washington Post article I'm looking at. You know, one one would uh, change our primary date from June to March. And that would help supposedly uh, help defeat Trump by giving California a bigger say.
USA uh, early on and helping Democrats unify behind a candidate for 2020. And then they could focus their attention on him rather than each other. I mean, how well did that work with Hillary Clinton? Yeah. She was pretty much a... <laughs> right. uh, but anyway, all it's going to do is help Kamala Harris and uh, or Eric Garcetti, the Los Angeles mayor, neither of which are, I think, candidates that could ever, they're such leftists, how would they appeal to the to the upper Midwestern states that, that pushed Trump over the line? I mean, I think a Kamala Harris or Eric Garcetti as the presidential candidate is probably a, a godsend to Trump. The other one, which is just in the silliness uh, category, is, is um, basically it would require anyone who wants to compete in the presidential race on California's ballots to release five years of their tax returns and obviously targeted at Trump. Yeah, there's so many ways around that. I mean, I think I think the Republican Party could probably just decide on its own and the National Republican Party to divvy up delegates differently. Right. They, they don't they're not bound by the current system. So you could do a caucus, I think, or, yeah, could, or the party convention. Could party do could just do it. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 silly. And, and it's just more uh, childish venting of the sort. Uh, and then the, and then the third one is more substantive sanctuary uh, state, uh, which limits the ability of state and local officials to cooperate with uh, federal uh, agents and deporting people. Now I'm I'm pretty I'm really open on immigration. I mean I'm 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 not a I'm not an immigration restrictionist. But again, this seems to chip at the rule of law and and encourage the the Trump supporters just to show that California is is out of control. And and I, I don't see how that helps anything other than other than Trump. So so all their efforts probably are going to end up helping reelect the guy that they are so fixated on. I, a couple leaders, even even I believe Jerry Brown at one point told them to just kind of chill out and get back to work. And I think that's what needs to happen. Just January 3rd, just get to work. There are a lot of real problems other than Trump. One of the biggest issues this year was not a bill, but a court ruling that created a big loophole with Propositions 13 and 218. The Supreme Court issued a ruling in August that seemingly makes it easier for tax increase proposals that come by way of voter initiative to be approved by a simple majority vote. Republicans introduced legislation to close its loophole, but the issue wasn't resolved before the end of the session. What do you think is the impact of this ruling? Um, will Republicans be successful in closing this loophole next year or sometime down the road? No, Republicans, I can't imagine them being successful at anything here. Uh, no, that's going to be settled. I, well, it, it's 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 going to be hard to see. I don't know how it's going to be settled. I mean, it was the state Supreme Court decision. The two best, the two dissenting justices, as I recall, were, uh, were Brown appointees. Yes. Um, uh, one of them was a former Obama administration official who stood up for taxpayers. So this one's... The, the problem here is uh, local governments, let's say uh, they, they can kind of with a wink and a nudge have unions go to the polls and collect signatures for a tax increase. So let's say the unions are negotiating with the city council and the city council says, oh no, we don't have the money to give you a raise. And then the unions say, hey, we'll put a tax increase to pay for that raise. Now, the justices and the majority made a distinction between referendum or initiatives that were taken to the to the uh, ballot by voters and ones taken to the ballot by officials. So essentially what we have here is it, it's a complicated, I'm, I'm fumbling it here, but it's a complicated workaround where, where unions can collude with union friend, friendly city councils to get around Prop 218's two-thirds vote requirement for, for tax increases. So the unions can go to the ballot and can have a majority rather than a, a super majority already vote because the the unions they're pe they're the people uh, gathering the gathering the initiative signatures rather than the, the city council uh, doing it and then the, the the justices said that that's um, you know that's not bound by prop 218 so bottom line is it's it's going to be a big problem I, I'm not sure what I it's I'm not sure what the strategy is now I haven't interviewed the the folks who had been fighting this in court and uh, I think there there are actually other legal strategies even though it was a state Supreme Court decision but I don't don't imagine anything that the legislature that Republicans would propose in the legislature would have a chance of passing if it's about restricting taxes. Every year there's a bill that seems to kind of sneak under the radar that's critically important, but it goes either unreported or underreported. So in your view, what's one bill from 2017 that everybody should be talking about but isn't? Yeah, I, I mean, I think of AB 1513, uh, which deals with private in home care services. So uh, let's say I'm a private employee working for you, a private employer being hired by a private individual who let's say wants some help with their elderly or, or sick or disabled family member. All of 
the unions want to get their teeth into these folks and help unionize them. And we referred to this sort of thing a little earlier, but what it does is requires that that these workers register with the state and that that's the state can can uh, give that information uh, to unions, uh, personal information, home addresses, cell phone numbers, names, and then be contacted by unions. I mean, that seems like a terrible invasion of privacy. And the reason I pick it out is I could easily see this expanding to other private industries. It's one thing. This isn't the same thing as like the in-home health services, which is largely government funded. I mean, I'm not advocating this sort of thing for that. That either, but at least there's a government funding mechanism there that maybe justifies some of this information. But we're talking about private businesses and private people using private money. And all of a sudden now the unions are going to be able to give you a call at home and say, hey, or show up at your doorstep and say, hey, don't you think think you might want to join the union? What do you think? So I, I think that it's I think it's dangerous and we're going to see this spread to other industries. So that's why I give it the, uh, you know, the kind of scary but unheard of award. See, there's always unfinished business at the end of a first year of a two-year legislative session. Looking ahead, what do you think is the biggest piece of unfinished business from 2017 that will be on the agenda for lawmakers in 2018? Yeah, I think bail reform, SB 10, Senate Bill 10 by Bob Hertzberg, that, that's become a big issue here. And some of the criminal justice reforms had, had been gaining steam, but most of them just petered out. But this one is, uh, you know, it's just like a, a nationwide movement to reform bail. And uh, the problem, I think, with the bail system as as it is now, is that if a person is uh, is in jail and has been accused but not convicted of a crime and they don't have any money, they can't get out or their family doesn't have any money to post the bond and that makes them more likely to cop a plea. So John and uh, Lynn, Lynn Darnold Foundation, they did a uh, they did a study showing that the conviction rate is much higher for, for people without money because they have to they cop a plea so that they can get home and pay rent, uh, keep their kids out of the clutches of child protective services. Uh, conservatives worry that, uh, that this eliminating money bail as we have it now, you know, where you go to a bail bondsman, it's like an insurance agent, and you pay generally 10% of the fee schedule for whatever the crime is. So if it's a million dollar uh, crime, you pay $100,000 to get out. And if you don't show up, uh, the bail bonds company supposedly forfeits uh, that money. But conservatives or Republicans in the legislature are worried that it might end up leading to, uh, you know, dangerous criminals being let out. Supporters of, of bail reform say that, no, it's still all going to go to a judge. It's just money is not going to be the pure determiner of whether you stay in or out. So it's an interesting issue, whatever side a person comes down on. It's actually one of the more significant issues that the legislature has has dealt with. And the bill, um, the governor said that he he supports the concept, but needs to work more on the bill. So that one's definitely coming back. That, that just kind of stalled out. We're in a two-year session. So you'll be seeing that issue uh, front and center as we get back. So every year we know the legislative session always has the the silly and the absurd. And one bill that you wrote about, and I've written about it too, that I think is crazy, is this bill targeting Blue Apron and home uh, meal delivery services. Talk about this bill and why you think that's a silly idea and any other silly bills that we should be focused on from this session. Oh yeah, well, Blue Apron, it's a it's a pretty cool company and based in Richmond. I think their headquarters are in New York, but they have a, a facility in Richmond with 1,250 people, Richmond, California. And and essentially, they pack it uncooked foods. Uh, they take meats that have been sealed, though they come from the butcher all sealed, and they put in some produce. I have never gotten one of them. I don't mind grocery shopping, but but it's for people I, who, don't, who like to cook but don't want to grocery shop, right? I've tried it. They actually, it's a fun thing. Yeah. You know, you try things you might not necessarily normally make. You get to keep the recipes, and yeah. it's a fun little thing, but it's not for everybody, especially if you have to cook for a big family. For one or two people, it works. Yeah, my daughter and San Francisco uh, gets it and she enjoys it. She Yeah, she experiments. So it's a cool idea, business model. It's the kind of thing California uh, officials ought to be celebrating, right? Because it, they, they use locally grown Northern California, sustainable blah, blah, blah. It's healthy food. Farm to fork. Yeah, farm to fork. <laughs> it's healthy, right? Isn't it better for people to cook their meal than go to a, a fast food restaurant? Except that the unions, again, it's here we see, see a common theme, want to, want to force the people who put the stuff in the box, the workers at, at the warehouse. So the other thing is they're fixing up an old warehouse area of, of a hard-pressed city. They want to force them to get a food handler 
card. Now, a food handler card doesn't sound like a big deal. A person spends, uh, I don't know what it is, 10 bucks. You learn how to handle food. It's it's just one of these state regulations. But the fact is that it, that then allows the unions to get their hands on the information. And Blue Apron already is follows much higher regulatory standards as a food processing company. So all the, this is why it's so silly. Now, all the, su the supporters of this bill kept pointing to Blue Apron and Blue Apron and Blue Apron. When you look at the official legislative argument for it from the committee, they, they why is this bill needed? Blue Apron, those are the first words. It doesn't apply to Blue Apron. At the hearing, because Blue Apron's already certified as a food processor, and this apparently only applies to food handling companies that aren't already uh, regulated. As, so this is the one I talked about earlier, where nobody really knew in the hearing, in the Senate hearing, who does it apply to? And and it, and, and the senators uh, were unclear. And the sponsor, who's from Richmond, you ought to be advocating for the local homegrown business. Uh, he, he, he gave a really convoluted answer. So anyway, it's just the fact that they're so desirous of regulating on behalf of the unions that even they'll regulate even when they don't even know what it is they're actually regulating. So I think that's uh, that's a good one. There's the one also on the, the um, a good one as a good silly example of a bill, you know, the non-binary on the license. So, um, I mean, I don't care about those things. I mean, what's the difference? I just, you now pick male or female. Now you could pick non-binary, but the advocates for a champion that is like some big civil rights thing. I mean, it just seems like something the Department of Motor Vehicles ought to be able to do without any fanfare, right? You have another category. Who the heck cares? But but it's just this, this fixation on hot button social issues rather than than fixing the problems that really confront the state. And I would argue, too, it's a fixation on headline grabbing. Yeah. We read something in the paper, let's rush to have a bill on that. Yeah, that's right. I, I call it uh, legislating by anecdote. Like yes. you, like a per, uh, legislators go out to the store and something happens they don't like and they rush back to, oh my God, I didn't realize that. And uh, this loophole we have to fix. They have to fix. If you look at this list of bills, there isn't an area of our life that they do not feel like they have a right to to meddle in some way with and that's what really I, I get resentful after a while and and then on all these these gender issues I mean I, I'm a libertarian I don't care but why not just fix problems rather than that try to get press conferences and headlines and make it look like you're you know the the modern day Rosa Parks right this, this has been great Steve so finally our last question Steve this is a time when we ask our guests um, for a wine recommendation and we call our podcast another round because we're close proximity to to wine country. So if you can share your favorite wine or cocktail with our listeners. Oh, sure. As a as a resident of, uh, of a rural area south of Sacramento, I'm an advocate for the Lodi area uh, wines. I'm an Old Vines Infidel fan. So uh, I think uh, Oak Ridge Winery, just, uh, just east of uh, downtown Lodi, has wonderful uh, Zinfandels. Moss Rocks, M-O-S-S-R-O-X-X -S 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 is, my, is my favorite, kind of smoky. M2 Winery in uh, uh, in north of Lodi, make some really delicious uh, Zinfandels, and then uh, and then I also uh, put in a pitch for the uh, the California Shenandoah Valley over near Plymouth. As you get in the foothills, there are some really lovely uh, wineries. They have wider variety. There's uh, Zinfandels and some others, but uh, I, I like to go to Dobra Zemlja, uh, which yes. is a big, bold. Uh, the Croatian, they're Croatian. The, the, the owners and it's big bold Croatian Zinfandel so anyway that's I'm, I'm no wine expert but that's what I like <laughs> thanks very much thanks Tim thanks to our guest Steve Greenhut and to my colleague Tim Anaya to stay up to date with PRI please go to our brand new website at pacificresearch.org and mark your calendars for PRI's annual gala on November 1st 2017 our keynote speaker is Silicon Valley entrepreneur Peter Thiel if you like this episode Please tell your friends and subscribe to Another Round with PRI at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash pacificresearch1. That's the number one. Thanks again for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. We hope you'll come back again for Another Round with PRI.